Hello and welcome back to the channel. It's Mark from PowerSonic and Apprentice One to One. Today we're going to have a look at some RCD testing. And this isn't just any old RCD. This is a three phase four pole RCVO. It's a type A and 30 milliamp rated. There are some things we need to consider when we're carrying out our tests and we're going to reference into guidance note three for that. We're going to have a look at some of the equipment that you can use and how you go about testing these RCDs to ensure that they're operating correctly and you're fulfilling your obligations within BS7671. So without further ado, let's get some of the equipment about out and talk about how we go about doing this. So first and foremost, obviously when we're inside a distribution board or consumer unit, there are live parts in there. It's live working elements to doing your live tests. And we need to remember with the electricity at work regulations, that should only be done when it's unavoidable. Obviously, if we need to get a test value and we're going to consider where we take that test from, which we'll get to later on in this video, then we do need to be around those parts and we need to reference in to GS38 for the types of probes we're using. Now, these are voltage indicators, but as you can see on the end there, we've got the exposed two millimeter tips on that one and these one have the retractable covers. So you're not exposing any extra metal parts in and around the terminals while you're working. You also have your finger guards on them as well. When we move into the actual MFT world of things, I'll show you one of this one here. So when you are carrying out your tests, you need to keep your fingers behind those guards. So you've got a good distance away. And again, the two millimeter probes, don't be going in with these, just because one wrong slip in the wrong place and you touch a bit of that, you can become part of the path for the electrons to start flowing and that doesn't turn out nice for anyone. You can also get these little rubber boots here that you can see. So your probes go in the end there and they're fully insulated. So if you're crocodile clipping onto to cables and such or to terminal bars, these are a really useful option. They're not the ones I'm going for in this case because they don't tie up with the leads on my MFT. But I just wanted to show you them because they are a cool innovation. If I bring you in a little bit closer, we'll have a look around this distribution board and talk about how we're going to go about it. One final point of note is to do with the PPE you might want to be wearing. And that's largely related to reducing your potential chances of coming into contact with live parts, but also any arc flash. If there's a mistake or something goes wrong in the distribution board at the point you're carrying out the test that you've considered that. Now, at some main intake areas, you could have quite large fault currents. That may mean you have to wear your face shield, maybe an arc suit. It's important to consider that. In this case, we've got very, very low fault current. It is a simulated training environment. So I'm just going in with the gloves and glasses, but it will vary depending on the actual installation under test. So one of the primary things to consider is the board you're gonna be working within. This is an MCCB panel board from Proteus with the added benefit of having regular spine board up the top there. So we're looking at our shields. We've got shields on these neutral and earth bars up the top here. The terminals on our MCCBs in here are all covered. Obviously we can isolate all of these so they're all off and there's no live energy in as many places as possible. But we will need to make sure we leave power on up to the RCD we're testing itself because we need that energy to do the RCD tests. Now, as I explained here, we've disconnected the final circuit from this RCBO and that's just to ensure that the final circuit itself isn't contributing to any kind of background leakage currents. And you can see if we come in here, this is a four pole RCBO for Proteus. Now you can probe onto the line and neutral terminals if you want. Um, I will demonstrate that to show that you can do it either way around, but there's negligible difference and we're trying to reduce our access to any parts. So the best approach, in my opinion, is to get your crocodile clips onto the earth and neutral points. Now there is a neutral bar up here, which is closer to the source. However, it's connected by quite a large conductor and I don't think that's gonna contribute a great deal to our results. So I'm happy probing onto there. If we were getting a result that wasn't acceptable, it might be worth considering going direct to the terminals, but that's close enough for me that we know that it's not really impacting into any of the results we're gathering. And same for the earth here, the actual main earthing point in this board is down in this bottom corner. However, it's quite a large conductor and it keeps all of our cables that we've got in the board away from as much of the live parts as possible. And I think that sets up in a safe and um, easy way to gather the results. If we look at the instrument itself, so we can see here, we've got our leads going into the top. They're inserted correctly. There's no frayed or damaged leads. We've checked all of those. And we need to look at how we're setting this instrument up. So we need to go into the general purpose RCD. So that's the G mode. 
and we need to be checking that we're in the right setup. Now you can see with this instrument we can go down and do varied tests but we know from guidance note 3 that we should test these as a type AC, RCD and we want to make sure we're on the 30 milliamp and the one times test. As you can see we are here. If I go into there we could do um, an auto test. We'll maybe run through that sequence anyway just to demonstrate it. But in terms of complying with BS7671 and what it wants, that is what we need to be doing. So if I pop you down here and try and get this all in shot, it's quite difficult uh, recording and doing this. And um, I'm going in one gloved because I need the other one to operate the screen on the camera to get the zoom and focus right. So I'll make sure I keep just my one gloved hand near these live parts. So we've now energized that RCBO and we've got power up to there. Um, if I probe on now to L1, we should start to see a voltage on the instrument. Now with your GS38 probes, they can be a bit fiddly to get on the screw heads, so it's worth making sure you've got a good purchase on there and you're getting the measurements you need. And you can see we are. If I hit test, it'll run through that and it's obtained a trip within 38 milliseconds. Now if we want, we can do that again at 180 degrees. So we can re-energize that power. Again, probe on to L1 and we can hit that test button. And again, 38 milliseconds. Now we know from operating RCDs, they only have a certain lifespan. And one of the things the regulations are using as the reason for not doing the auto tests that we once did across all of these that we're just about to run through is it contributes to the wear on the RCD. However, we're gonna run through that test and you can see with this as well, we can also drop into the type A mode for the RCD as well, which we know this is. So we can test in that function. Um, now, Guidance Note 3 gives that as an option for when you're fault finding. So if you read Guidance Note 3, I'll dig the page out in a minute and we'll chat about it at the end of the video. Um, you can run through these tests in certain circumstances, but you don't need them for your schedule of test results any longer. Uh, so again, if I go on to L1, we should start to measure voltage if I get the probe in the right place. If we hit, hold the test button down long enough, you can see we've got that operation. I'll try and do this one-handed if I can. Again, so we're getting faster on the five times as we'd expect. Now a half time, it shouldn't operate. And again, I'm making sure I keep my fingers behind the finger guards on the probes and I'm not anywhere near anything that can hurt me. And if I come off those terminals now, we've gathered our results. I'll bring you in a little bit closer to the screen in case it wasn't focused correctly in that little segment. So you can see we've got 39 and 37 milliseconds on our times one, and we've got 21 milliseconds on our times five for both zero and 180 degrees and then no operation at our half times. Because what you can find if you test end of line on these, as we discussed earlier on in the video, uh, the half time test can sometimes operate the RCD if you've got enough cumulative leakage sitting around uh, in the background on your circuits. Most RCDs tends to go between sort of 21 to 24 milliamps. Um, so that's kind of where you, you are with that. Now we can do a ramp test, so we'll see how this actually operates. If I go back into here and set it up for a ramp test. So we're gonna to go to the ramp test now, and if we enter that state, it should start to tell us uh, where the actual operating point of this is. So if I probe onto L1 again, make sure we get a good contact on there. See, we have, hit the test. And as we just discussed, that's gone out at around 24 milliamps, so. If you imagine you had a bit of background leakage current on a circuit because you'd left those final conductors, um, your final circuit conductors in the terminals, and that could have an impact. Or if you'd gone to end of line to carry out your measurement, equally the same. So you can, if you want, repeat those tests on L1, L2 and L3. Most RCBOs and RCDs, that's not necessary because either one of those phases would affect the tripping coil in exactly the same way. Well, if you've got doubts about that particular device, you might want to repeat that test. And just for thoroughness, if you see it like that, you can do so as well. And I'm going to show you on this board here how that plays out when we do that test just now. Okay, so I've got this set up in exactly the same way. We've done all the other tests on um, L1 so far. So we'll jump onto L2. You can see the voltage has increased ever so slightly. 
Uh, again, similar tripping time, 38 milliseconds. If we reset that again and go back to L3, make sure we're probing on to the terminal. Oh, that's on the neutral. Onto L3 and hit test. And again, 38, 40 milliseconds, all much the same. So I also wanted to demonstrate the neutral and the line um, on the terminals themselves. So you can see I've got the neutral probe now as well going up there. It is a bit tricky with the two GS38 probes onto screw heads in one hand, but I'm gonna give it my best effort. So we get the voltages to settle there, apply the right pressure, and you can see we've got the same 40 milliseconds or so with that as well. Okay, so we've got Guidance Note 3, which has got some really useful help in terms of RCD testing. Uh, it starts on around page 95-ish, and page 98 has got kind of the two different test methods, or the intro to those. We're going to use test method 1 in this. Test method 2 is more for if you've got a lack of selectivity with your RCDs and RCBOs, but I've reconfigured our setup here, so that's not the case. We are just going to be testing the device in this board. Um, and it says here that RCD test method 1 is preferred where RCD is used for fault protection as it provides further validation that the RCD is operating within a specific time for a simulated fault to the relevant protective conductor. So if you've got TT install where you've got fault protection from your RCD, you need to do test method 1. The, tests, the test is made on the load side of the RCD between the line conductor of the protected circuit and the associated CPT. The load should be disconnected during the test to avoid spurious results. These tests can result in potentially dangerous voltages on exposed conductive parts and extraneous conductive parts when the EFLI approaches the maximum acceptable limits. Precautions must therefore be taken to prevent contact of persons, livestock and such. So when you're doing this test, you need the install under controlled conditions and we need to make sure that we're testing these RCDs at source or that we are certain that there is no other loads causing any spurious values. So some people have the approach of going to end of line to carry out this test. Other people do it on the actual terminals of the RCDs. You'd get limited difference in your results wherever you carry out that test. Obviously end of line proves the point that when you're at that accessory, you are gonna get operation of an RCD if there is a fault at that point. However, your prior tests for your uh, fault loop impedance um, and your dead tests would all lead you towards that being the case anyway. Um, and the easiest way of making sure you've got nothing connected in the final circuit is to carry out the test on the RCD on its terminals with the wires out of it. Um, that's the way I approach it. Now, obviously, it's different for everybody, and I don't think there's any real right or wrong in this, um, but that's the way I would go about it. Now, if you haven't got a selectivity between your RCDs, so Caravan Park's a good example, um, you might get operation of devices you know, upstream to where you're testing, and that's not going to be really very helpful, and it details some things you can do with testing of your RCCBs, RCDs, and then your RCBOs, as well as you'll see in some of these illustrations. And again, they're around page 100 in Guidance Note 3, if you want to go and have a look at those. Um, we're going to go to the, the test results now. So results of RCD test. The maximum disconnection time for a residual test current of I delta N should not exceed the relevant non-time delayed values shown in table 2.17. And we'll have a look at those in a minute. Um, there's obviously got your test button and such as well that you can operate. And if we find these tables. So we've had to dig a little bit further back to page 96 where this table 2.17 resides. And um, it's telling us to use an RCD tester for these tests where the RCD tester is capable of testing RCDs with different residual current operating con characteristics, so type A, C, type A, type F, type B, it should be configured for the correct setting for the test being undertaken as indicated in table 2.17. RCDs are marked with symbols to indicate their residual current operating characteristics. So it's telling us here the recommended tests, this is part A of that, and it's telling us for the RCD types, it says all we should do, um, type AC testing at half times I delta N and one times I delta N. And there's a, a recommendation to go and read note four as well. And it's telling us here that RCDs to harmonize standards, C note two, of non-delayed variety should trip within 300 milliseconds on that times one test. And if it's an S type, so a delayed one, it should trip within 500 milliseconds. If it's an RCD to BS4293 or BS7288, it should trip within 200 milliseconds. And that's the tests 
you would need to record the values of within your scheduled test results. Now it says here, examples of optional RTD tests for fault finding and similar purposes. And that goes on to kind of detail doing your five times test, your zero and 180 degree tests. And if you want, moving your instrument into the specific mode for it. So if it's type A, F or B to their harmonized standards. Now these notes down here, note two, kind of tells us the harmonized standards in relation to this table are considered to be UK implementation of the harmonized document 62640. And the note four, which was to do with the I times delta N up here, is the test is required by regulation 643.7 as BS 7671 where the RCD is used for automatic disconnection of the supply, so ADS, or regulation 643.8 of BS7671, where it's used for additional protection. RCDs to BS4293 or 7288 should meet the operating times of the appropriate product standard, um, where these are shorter than those specified in BS7671 Amendment 2 2022, because a longer operating time than that in the relevant product standard may indicate that the RCD is no longer operating correctly. The longest tripping time for each of the two tests, 0 and 180 degrees, is recorded in column 28 of your schedule of test results. So that's guidance note three, really telling us that you just need to do your one times test and your half times test, 0 and 180 degrees, because that's what the test sheet wants to see. And they're referencing in there that putting these through their tests can increase the wear on the products. Um, so we may be contributing to them failing more soon than they would if we weren't testing them. We also need to remember that we can't replicate the tests these manufacturers do in their manufacturing facilities to the product standards. It's really hard with a multifunction test instrument on site. And some um, installers were getting spurious results and sending the products back to manufacturers thinking they were faulty when they actually weren't. It was just the way we were testing them. That's what has been decided by JPL64 and the people writing BS7671 and the manufacturers have been involved in those discussions. So that is what we have to take at face value and move forward with as installers. So I hope you found that useful. And again, this came from a question that somebody had sent in from over on Instagram, I think it was, where I'd shared some footage of doing a ZE and a PFC test. Um, so now their training providers wouldn't actually show them any live testing because they don't believe that it should be done and it's exposing yourself to unnecessary danger. So I would love to know from the trainers and lecturers out there how you go about getting your ZE measurements um, and your RCD measurements. I've shown on the channel before how you can take your end of line ZS measurements quite safely with very minimal exposure to live parts using the right adapters and such. So we know that that's possible, but in circumstances like this, there are always gonna be elements of being around um, electricity. And I think it's really tragic that new people coming into industry aren't being given those skills to understand how to do that safely. Obviously, the ones who are with their employers out doing apprenticeships, they'll be shown a lot of this in the vocational aspects of the training. But we need to remember so many people are on those level two and level three full time study routes and then going off to do portfolios. And they might never have been shown these things. Um, and I think we can do much better with stuff like that. And that's why I've made this little bit of content. I'm not a lecturer. I'm sure there will be errors within this content, as there is in much of my other content to the book. Um, but I've done my best and just shared, shared my approach and the way I go about doing this at the age of 44 now from spending 25 odd years, probably longer, doing this job. Um, so yeah, drop your comments in below if you've got anything that you think might help a learner. They do follow along with a fair bit of my posts on YouTube and other platforms and you never know, them reading that might help them as well. You can see it's very cold out here today. It's absolutely Baltic. I think it's like minus four outside. So I'm going to dive back into the warm and edit this video together. If you've got any comments or questions more widely, please, as always, do drop them in below. If you haven't already, consider subscribing to the channel. I try and cover all kinds of topics on here from out in the day job doing EICRs, installations, and obviously the solar and renewable side of things down to videos like this as well. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you on the next one.